Pope Francis in the birthplace of Islam. The Holy Father calls for full religious freedom in the UAE during his historic visit. Yearbook photo fallout. The Virginia governor faces political pressure after a racist picture from the 80s resurfaces. We have team coverage. More troops to the U.S. border. The Pentagon announces additional support as the president prepares to deliver his second State of the Union. And faith and the big game. We'll weigh in on the Super Bowl featuring two Catholic quarterbacks from the same archdiocese. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, February 4th, 2019. The Pope and the Grand Imam of the United Arab Emirates sign a historic Pledge of Unity. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thank you to those of you joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. It's the first papal visit to the Arabian Peninsula. Pope Francis calls for an end to wars in the Middle East, and he condemned all violence committed in God's name. The UAE is part of a Saudi-led military coalition fighting a war in Yemen. In an agreement, the Imam and the Pope say they will work together to fight extremism. The Pope's 40-hour trip will conclude tomorrow with the first papal mass on the Arabian Peninsula. Tens of thousands of faithful are expected in a never-before-seen display of public Christian worship. Senza libertà non si è più figli della famiglia umana. In a keynote speech to an interfaith gathering, the Holy Father warned the future of humanity is at stake if religious leaders don't work together. The address capped a historic day that began with a grandiose welcome ceremony. A military flyover left yellow and white smoke, Vatican colors. Even for a nation known for its excesses, the red carpet welcome was remarkable for a pope who prides himself on simplicity. The Holy Father visited the Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi and was greeted by the Grand Imam. Even U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo acknowledged the historical significance of this trip. In a tweet, he said, The United States applauds the Pope's arrival in UAE as an historic moment for religious freedom. The first Holy Mass by a Pope in the Arabian Peninsula promotes peace and understanding between two of the world's great religions. The official religion in the UAE is Islam, but the church estimates there are about one million Catholics, mostly expats from the Philippines and India. Pope Francis is promoting Christian-Muslim dialogue. He will also bolster the diverse Catholic community with an open-air mass on Tuesday at the city's sports stadium. National Catholic Register's Edward Penton is in the press corps traveling with Pope Francis. He joins us now from Abu Dhabi. Edward. Yes, well, the highlight, Lauren, of today has been this document signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of al Azhar University, the highest institution of learning in Sunni Islam. The document calls on all people of goodwill to unite and work together uh, towards human fraternity, reconciliation and mutual respect. Uh, the Vatican is calling it a very important step in Christian-Muslim relations and a way forward to reconciliation with, for all people of goodwill. Uh, this uh, marks the end of uh, the Pope, Pope Francis's first day here, first full day here at, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, tomorrow he leads a, a mass, an open-air mass. He'll celebrate that in front of up to 135,000 uh, faithful uh, before leaving for Rome, which will end uh, a very quick 48-hour trip, but one that he said is going to be very important. Uh, back to you, Lauren, in Washington. Thank you so much. That was Edward Penton of the National Catholic Register. Our other top story this evening, Democrats are calling for one of it, their own to step down. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam ignited a firestorm of criticism for admitting then denying he appeared in a racist photo from the 1980s. Now he's reportedly met with staff to see if it's viable for him to stay in office. We have team coverage tonight, including reaction from President Trump, but we'll start at the Capitol with Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Both of Virginia's Democratic senators and the dean of the state's congressional delegation agree. Northam must step down. But conservatives say it's shocking that party leaders didn't call for his resignation before when Northam expressed support for abortion up until birth and infanticide. Senator Rick Scott of Florida says Governor Northam should resign. I mean, I have six grandsons. 
I love my family. And I just can't imagine somebody would say after a child's born uh, that we're going to decide whether they're, they're going to live or not. That's disgusting. The controversy began after the governor backed a bill that would have allowed abortion up to birth and perhaps beyond. The infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mothers. This past weekend, pro-life Virginians protested. Northam is bought and paid for by the abortion yeah, industry. Right. Yeah. On him. Planned Parenthood Virginia donated nearly $2 million to Northam's 2017 campaign. Only a matter of seconds and a birth canal separates the two situations that were described. Then this photo in his medical school yearbook surfaced. It shows a man in blackface and a man in a KKK robe. That photo and the racist and offensive attitudes it represents does not reflect that person I am today. But then Northam changed his story. I tell the truth. I'm telling the truth today. That was not my picture. Northam did admit to wearing black on his face when impersonating Michael Jackson. I really do believe that both of them are wrong, uh, but there's a contrast between, between the black face and someone standing there in a Ku Klux Klan outfit and me dressed up in a Michael Jackson costume for a dance contest. If Northam resigns, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax would take over. Fairfax was a board member of Planned Parenthood Metropolitan Action Fund, and he defended Northam's abortion comments. Now he's defending himself against allegations of sexual misconduct dating to 2004. Fairfax claims it was consensual. Lauren? Number three up for review. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey. Thank you, Jason. We'll have more on that story in a moment. As top Democrats slam Northam for a racist photo, President Trump calls the governor unforgivable for his abortion comments as well. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. President Trump and the Democrats challenging him for the presidency in 2020 don't agree on many issues, but we are seeing bipartisan disapproval of Virginia's governor. Today, top presidential advisor Kellyanne Conway speaking out. I don't know anybody who's not disturbed by the images that we see in this medical yearbook and really disturbed by the governor's changing story. President Trump shared his disdain for the governor over the weekend after Northam backtracked on an initial apology for the photo in his med school yearbook. The president tweeted, Democrat Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia just stated, I believe that I am not either of the people in that photo. This was 24 hours after apologizing for appearing in the picture and after making the most horrible statement on super late term abortion unforgivable. This pro-abortion in like the 10th month uh, way that the Democratic Party is going. And the nation's top Democrats rejecting one of their own as the racist image came to light. He should resign. It really just was so disturbing. Presidential hopeful Senator Kirsten Gillibrand joins other Democrats running in 2020 who say the governor has got to go. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker tweeting, these images arouse centuries of anger, anguish, and racist violence, and they've eroded all confidence in Governor Northam's ability to lead. California Senator Kamala Harris adding, the governor of Virginia should step aside so the public can heal and move forward together. Now, the president's advisor, Kellyanne Conway, today said reporters don't want to cover the story on Governor Northam's abortion comments as much as the current story on the racist photo in his medical school yearbook. A senior administration official says tomorrow the president will talk about the, quote, fundamental importance of the right to human life in his State of the Union address. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. Tomorrow night, President Donald Trump will deliver his second State of the Union. The official theme of the speech, choosing greatness. EWTN News Nightly will have comprehensive coverage tomorrow on air and on our social media platforms. We'll have a breakdown of the speech and reaction on Wednesday. <laughs> Top military officials announced more than 3,700 troops are heading to the southwest border. Their goal is to help Border Patrol respond to what the president has called a national security crisis. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the Pentagon. Good evening, Wyatt. Lauren, good evening. Acting Defense Secretary Pat Shanahan says the mission on the U.S.-Mexico border has grown in size and scale. The additional troops will bring the total number to just a little over 4,300. Shanahan says 150 miles of wire barriers and a new mobile monitoring system will be installed. 
The added military personnel are only scheduled to be stationed at the border for 90 days. President Trump followed up on the announcement with a tweet. With caravans marching through Mexico and toward our country, Republicans must be prepared to do whatever is necessary for strong border security. Dems do nothing. If there is no wall, there is no security. Human trafficking, drugs, and criminals of all dimensions keep out. Critics say the troops are being used as a political ploy, but the president disagrees. Human trafficking can go down by a tremendous percentage if we had a wall at our southern border. Tremendous. Because it's very hard to do human trafficking through ports of entry. Because you have people standing there looking and they say, hey, what's going on in the back seat? Democrats question whether a border mission is a distraction, but some top military personnel back the president's plan. The first active duty troops were sent to the border at the end of October and have been there for more than three months. Now, the U.S. Bishops Conference says there is nothing immoral about deploying troops to a border or securing the border in general. But Bishop Joseph Vasquez of Austin, Texas, says that there's another side to the coin to this, which is welcoming those migrants who have fled violence in their home country. He says the U.S. must do both things, secure the border and welcome refugees. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the Pentagon. Thank you, Wyatt. Police in the Philippines announce arrests in the bombing of a Catholic cathedral. Five suspected Islamic militants surrendered to authorities. They will be charged with murder for their role in the January bombing of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in the southern part of the country. 23 people died. 100 others were hurt. A former mayor of El Salvador's capital takes a selfie with supporters after winning the country's presidential election. Nayib Bukele received more votes than his two closest rivals combined to end a quarter century of two-party dominance. Bukele was born to a Catholic mother and a Muslim father. He says he believes in God but not organized religion. Pope Francis says politicians should make defending the unborn a priority. The Holy Father told members of Italy's pro-life movement on Saturday a newborn child brings newness, future, and life to society. He says where there is life, there is hope. And on Sunday, the Pope visited homeless people living at a parish near Rome's airport. Pope Francis was given a tour by clergy and airport managers before meeting with people who have come to the center for a bed and a hot meal. Coming up. Gloria Purvis, host of Morning Glory on EWTN Radio, joins us to talk about abortion, eugenics, and the governor of Virginia. And is the new makeup of the Supreme Court good news for the pro-life movement in Louisiana? The governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, still has not resigned despite overwhelming bipartisan calls for him to do so. The calls for him to step down were follow reports Friday that Northam appeared in his photo in his medical school yearbook, a, a man dressed in blackface, another person wearing a Ku Klux Klan robe and hood. Last week, he also faced criticism for his comments about a proposed bill calling for abortion up until a woman was in labor, some calling it infanticide. Earlier today, Virginia's lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, spoke out saying, I believe the governor has to make a decision that's in the best interest of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Joining me now is Gloria Purvis, host of Morning Glory on EWTN Radio. Gloria, welcome back to our broadcast. Thank you for having me, Lauren. Well, what's in the best interest of the state of Virginia? Justice. I mean, that's the first thing we should consider. What would be the just response in this case, seeing what he said about infanticide as well as his horrendous picture of being in either the Klan uniform or in blackface. Or and, as Michael Jackson. Or as Michael Jackson. In either case, what I'm finding a common thread here is that it's a disrespect for the human person. And as a pro-lifer, that is the base of our position for why we are pro-life, is a respect for the human person. They, everyone made in the image and likeness of God is worthy of respect and dignity. Now, he has not admitted to being in the photos. I think he did, yeah. or he might have, and then he didn't. Right. Anyway, it's, it's a big mess. But yes. let's talk about the uh, ties with Planned Parenthood. Northam had, as we reported earlier, about $2 million um, given to his campaign by Planned yes. Parenthood. 
And um, they're calling for him to step down, of course, not for the infanticide comment, right. but for the racist photos. M many people don't know about the origins of Planned Parenthood. Are these yes. photos a surprise to you? Not a surprise at all, given Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger, was a eugenicist, meaning she thought that only the fit should be allowed to have children, and of course, African Americans in her mind were not fit. And she started something called the Negro Project to try to fool people into accepting contraception, limiting their families. No surprise whatsoever that Planned Parenthood is tied into to this. Ralph Northam won the 2017 gubernatorial election. He appealed to non-white voters and African-American women. Mm -hmm. How do you think these new revelations are going to impact though his credibility. Well, I, I don't think he has the trust of the people now. First of all, coming out and saying, yes, it was me, now saying, no, it's not me. Um, people are wondering how at 25 years old, in medical school, that you would make the decision to put such a picture in your school yearbook. He wasn't a child. He wasn't a teenager. He was a grown man. And I imagine a lot of the voters of those categories that supported him are feeling betrayed. You know, there's an article that's uh, that's going around, and I've, I've seen it a lot of different places, a source from big league politics, mm. the group that broke this story, told the Washington Post that the source of the story reached out because of anger over Northam's recent comments about the bill and the abortion wow. um, restrictions, which I find... Um, fascinating since he was under such criticism about that. Well, I, I would, I'm kind of sad that they had to wait till they were angry about this, about infanticide. It w I would hope, have hoped that just seeing the pictures themselves and knowing that this person would have thought, you know, he wasn't fit to be the governor of Virginia and had revealed them earlier mm -hmm. so that Northam could have been called to account for that. And, and as a Catholic, mm -hmm. I want to say we need to recognize that what is equally upsetting about the picture is that we have to remember racism sends people to hell just as much as murder does. And his picture uh, with the Klan and their bloody history with blackface that supports those odious ideologies are the very essence of racism that our bishops just condemned in their pastoral letter last year. Gloria Purvis, host of Morning Glory on <laughs> EWTN Radio. I suggest to everyone you tune in. Thank what you. time? Early? 6 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Eastern. There we go. Thank you so much, Thank Gloria. you, Lauren. The Supreme Court could decide in the next few days whether Louisiana can begin enforcing a 2014 pro-life law. The measure requires abortion clinic doctors to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. The court struck down a similar law in Texas three years ago, but the court's lineup has changed since then to a fortified conservative majority. A priest in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, was allowed to celebrate mass on the same day he was listed as being accused of sexual abuse. The Archdiocese says Cardinal Daniel DiNardo allowed Father John Keller to say Mass because he was already scheduled to celebrate. Keller is among nearly 300 in the state credibly accused of abuse. Up next, a look at the number of men and women professing religious vows in 2018. And a Super Bowl for the record books. We'll talk about the Catholic connection. A new report highlights the number of Catholics who took religious vows in the U.S. last year. The report found at least 240 Catholic men and women made final vows in 2018. Two-thirds were born in the U.S., with Vietnamese-born vocations coming in second. The Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown University received data from about 70 percent of major superiors in the country. For more on the new religious, including how many cradle Catholics and converts are part of the group, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. The New England Patriots are the winners of the Super Bowl, led by quarterback Tom Brady. He's become the oldest quarterback to win a Super Bowl at age 41. Sunday's victory marks the sixth Super Bowl win for the Patriots. Joining me now, our favorite sports analyst, Doug Eldridge, sports agent, public relations consultant, managing partner of DLE Agency. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. All I have to say is boring. Oh, <laughs> oh come on. It was such a bad game. No, it, it looked so bad. It was more All historic right. than histrionic. And from the NFL standpoint, that was probably exactly what, what they, they wanted. wanted. All right, let's talk about the quarterbacks because I'm a big Tom Brady fan and everybody razzes me about it in my family. But he's Catholic, which I just recently found out, as is 
the other quarterback, they both went to Catholic schools in the same diocese. How yeah. odd is that? Absolutely. Well, I think it's wonderful. And, and I think so many times we've talked about the intersection of sports and faith. And literally driving to the studio today, I was thinking about it, and I think I've worded that all wrong. I don't think it's about the intersection of sports and faith. I think faith is at the very nucleus. It's the genesis of sports in so many ways. Really? And Tom Brady is emblematic of that. Jared Goff is emblematic of How? that. How? Because before they ever take the field, there's always the locker room prayer. And win, lose, or draw, everybody congregates on the sidelines, in the middle of the field, and in the locker room post game to have their prayer. Not just for th in thanks for the win or in mourning for the loss, but in gratitude for the ability to compete. And we've seen it even with our, with our own clients, like John Halapio, the, starter, the starting center for the New York Giants, a devout Catholic, a Tongan, a guy that, that exemplifies lead by deed, not just by word. I have I've sat here and had the privilege to talk to you on so many occasions about that intersection, really, genesis of sports and faith. But it is, it is throughout all of sports, Wimbledon to the World Cup to the Olympics to the Super Bowl. Is this faith or religion? You know, sometimes it's semantics depending on the definition of, of is, mm -hmm. right? But I, I think when you talk about demonstrable faith and, and the execution of the practice, you, mm -hmm. you have a scope and you have a range. You have those mm -hmm. that are regular practitioners. Mm -hmm. You have those sure, that, like that, are, in society. that are in service, right? Across all walks. Would you say that the NFL is more faith-based, religious-based, the athletes, than the general population? Well, I, I think... You're like, around them a lot. I, I, I am, and, and that's a real privilege, and I think... I think what I'm around is the things that, that you and the rest of the general public don't see. And, and I, I mentioned John a moment ago, and, and, and just using him, and we can even generic, but, but it's, it's jalapeno. I stand on these football fields, these high school fields. He went to a, a Catholic high school in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I stand in the middle of summer in, in thunderstorms and in mud amidst a litany of underprivileged, low-income, at-risk kids because John believes that you can never pay it back, but you can always pay it forward. forward. And he's the one that says, don't listen to my word, follow my deed. And so he creates a complete free football leadership program to try and influence. He realized that honey draws the bees. Football is a Trojan horse to get the message across. And, I, and, and Brady's I, emblematic of that as well. Right, and own, I think I've seen life. a lot. Actually, there was an ad last night um, talking about what the players have done. And yes. do to help other people. So much and underreported. Before we go, Maroon 5, big boy, I don't know. I was just happy that the, it wasn't racy. There were some shots that were a little off color, I thought, but I was just glad to be able to watch with my family, even though, again, I mean. Well, well but, but, th <laughs> but, th but when, we, when we talk about halftime or when we talk about ads, right, let's, let's think about, let's step away from the actual game and talk about the cultural event that is the Super Bowl. 110 million viewers, right? 139 million avocados, 1.3 billion Did you say chicken avocados? wings. Yeah, for oh. guacamole, right? <laughs> right? 11 million pounds of potato <laughs> chips. But why do I say that? Because this is about so much more than a game. It brings everybody from the aunt, the uncle, the baby sister, the brother to the couch to talk about more than just football. And when we talk about the halftime show, Maroon 5 is the vanilla ice cream of the office party. It's not everybody's favorite, but nobody's offended by it. I love and while vanilla it, ice cream. While I did not have like been Maroon boring, 5, but okay. While it might not right. have been boring, it, it was a great upsetting. experience, and right. it was a historic game by any metric or measurement. You're right. Thank you so much, Doug Eldridge. Always great to have you Thank here, you managing me. partner of DLE Agency. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.